first lockdown. And across the country today, there is going to be a minute's silence to remember all of those who've died during the coronavirus pandemic and also to reflect on what the country went through uh, during that extraordinary period. And so today, March the 23rd, marks the second anniversary of the first national lockdown, which was imposed to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic. That was a minute's silence for members of those who died during the coronavirus pandemic, exactly two years after the first national lockdown was imposed. The End of Life charity Marie Curie, which is organising remembrance events today, has also been encouraging people to shine a light or display flowers in their window at eight o'clock this evening. Now, with the time it just after 12 o'clock, a quick look at the headlines this lunchtime. The Chancellor is set to deliver his spring statement in the next half an hour on the day that the inflation rate rose to its highest in 30 years. The Office of National Statistics says the consumer price inflation, a, re a measure of the cost of living faced by households, rose to 6.2% in the year to February. Wishy Sunak will be up at 12.30, vowing to stand by British families amid the deepening cost of living crisis. Elsewhere, London Ambulance says it's dealing with what it describes as a major incident at the Queen Elizabeth Park in East London at the Aquatic Centre. It's understood to involve the release of a gas. A number of people have reported being treated for breathing difficulties. Fire and ambulance crews are on site. And the Ukrainian uh, President Volodymyr Zelensky has said that 100,000 people remain trapped in the besieged port city of Mariupol. He says if no food, water or medical supplies as Russian shelling continues. Meanwhile, the US and other Western nations are understood to be considering a move to potentially exclude Russia from the G20 group of largest economies. But China has said it supports Putin's participation in the next G20 summit, describing Russia as an important member. And of course, we'll bring you uh, news updates throughout the afternoon. We'll bring you Rishi Sunak's uh, spring statement at 12.30. But now, it's time for this. PMQ's Unpacked on Times Radio. Unpacking the politics and cutting through the crossfire. Order, order. I call Matt Chorley and Patrick Maguire. Yeah. Yes, it's that time on a Wednesday lunchtime where uh, Patrick Maguire is here looking very smart. He's got a tie. You can tell it's a big state occasion. <laughs> when I when I put a tie, there's a great Frankie Ball line about John Prescott being able to wear a tie and a belt on the same day without turning into sausages. Um, <laughs> that's sort of how I feel right now. So if I, you know, uh, if I... Uh, go silent. You know I've. We know uh, what's happened. The blood to my head has been cut. Well, off. if you want to see Patrick in his lovely smart tie, uh, you could go online right now to the YouTube's. Uh, go, go to YouTube, search for Times Radio, and then you'll be able to watch as well as listen along to PMQs. And Pat, let us know where you are. Logged on early. Greetings from Ipswich. Says Ian. Um, uh, where else are you? Upstate New York, says Candia. I love being able to watch and comment on the Times YouTube feed on Primus' questions as you get to debate but not shouty radio, says Glenn. Does he work here? Uh, is this how a Chorley dresses in spring, says Stephen. I've got a jacket on. He's in sunny Leicester. Uh, Matt is in sunny Manchester. Go online right now. Let us know where you are. You are watching PMQ's Unpacked. We will bring you Rishi Sunat's spring statement at 12.30. Uh, Patrick McGuire, what do you expect in this slightly strange uh, PMQs ahead of the spring statement? The, the big question is, does Keir Starmer want to get himself on the evening news by going on the cost of living? Or does he mark something else like, uh, you know, it's a month today since Russia invaded Ukraine, plenty to go on there. Or does he, uh, you know, steal some of the thunder from Rachel Reeves. It's, it's, you know, it's before the Lord Mayor's show, isn't it? Um, and I, I suspect Labour will, you know, Labour leader's office highly rate Rachel Reeves, hands by the shoulder into that role uh, last year. So I'd be surprised if Keir Starmer went on 
uh, rising inflation, the cost of living, um, you know, but th- th- there's a wealth of things he can go on today. One thing we should keep an eye out for is the word security. Uh, Keir Starmer used the word security a lot last week at PMQs in various contexts, whether it was talked about, you know, whether it's military or financial or whatever. Uh, talk that Rishi Sunak's going to try and reclaim the word security, uh, that he's going to provide security to. So uh, brace yourselves. We may well hear the word security a lot uh, in the next hour. Let's kick off then. This is PMQ's Unpacked, live on Times Radio and on the Times Radio YouTube channel. This is question number one from Keir Starmer. Of the opposition, Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 800 loyal British workers fired over Zoom, instantly replaced by foreign agency workers shipped in on less than the minimum wage. If the Prime Minister can't stop that, what's the point of his government? Prime Minister! Well, Mr. Speaker, we we condemn the callous behaviour of of PO. And I think, and I think that it is, I think that it is, I think that it is no way to treat hard-working uh, employees. And I can tell him that we will not sit by, uh, Mr. Speaker, because uh, because under Section 194 of the Trades Union and Labour Relations Act of 1992, it looks to me, Mr. Speaker, as though the company concerned has broken the law, and we will be taking action. Therefore and we'll, we will be encouraging uh, workers themselves to take action under the 1996 Employment Rights Act. Both acts, Mr Speaker, passed by Conservative governments. And, and, uh, and if the company is found guilty, uh, then they face fines running into millions of pounds, Mr Speaker. And in addition, uh, we will be taking steps to protect all mariners who are working in UK waters and ensure that they are all paid the living wage, Mr Speaker. Yes, Starmer. OK, so... Um, he's got on job security. He's got on job security, which I suspect we'll hear a little bit about in a moment. It is an extraordinary story, this P&O uh, story, laying off 800 people uh, at the drop of a hat. Um, uh, quite a good, sharp, pointy question from Keir Starmer. If you can't stop that, what's the point of his government? It is, and it, and it comes back to... Uh, do you remember a couple of months ago, Boris Johnson, at uh, Tory conference, um, was talking all about how uh, we were moving to uh, an economy full of higher wages, more secure employment. It's very weird to hear, uh, you know, Margaret, one of Margaret Thatcher's successors talking about labour market regulation uh, passed by Tory governments at the dispatch box, isn't it? But it's a, it's a very good pointed question because it, com- it, it and I'm sure we'll hear a lot about this from Keir Starmer, it's quite a rare question that it allows him to criticise the government over Brexit in such a way that doesn't cut across uh, Labour's squeamishness to being seen as a continuity Remain party, which obviously Keir Starmer is the former shadow Brexit secretary, is particularly alive to that criticism. Um, Boris Johnson clearly was expecting this because he's read up on his 1994 Trades Union and Labour Market Act of, ni- uh, uh, of 1994 and the 1996 Employment Rights Act. He's very pleased with that. I, I wonder, and maybe this is where uh, Keir Starmer's going to go, there was this story that Sky News had spoken to a maritime lawyer who said that um, the reason PMO could do this legally was uh, thanks to a law signed off by Chris Grayling. Everyone's just when just when you think you're out the Chris Grayling <laughs> material, they for, for pull those, you back for those in. Of us, for those of us who are fans of Chris Grayling, this is excellent news. Um, uh, less so, obviously, if you work for P&O. But yeah, it was a legislation to protect employees in the UK was amended by Chris Grayling in 2018. So the Transport Secretary does not have to be notified of mass redundancies on ships registered overseas. Uh, so therefore, uh, f- normally failure to meet the notification obligation would be a criminal offence, but that um, appears to have been removed. Keyword there, overseas. It wouldn't surprise me if by the end of this line of questioning, Keir Starmer might have started talking about, you know, the Tories' love of offshore finance. Uh, you know, Alisher Usmanov, the uh, Uzbek-born um, oligarch who has been using a variety of trusts and whatever to evade UK sanctions. I think we're going to be hearing a lot about the Tories' failure to... Uh, regulate and the notion of taking things offshore uh, as this line of questioning develops, I think. OK, let's go back to question number two from Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, when Owen Paterson was on the ropes, the Prime Minister was prepared to rip up the entire rule book to save his jobs. p workers want to sh- him to show the same fight in relation to them. The government had advance warning of these mass sackings. A memo was sent to the Transport Secretary and to the Prime Minister's office. 
but they didn't lift a finger to stop no, them. No, no, no. Did the Prime Minister not understand the memo, or did he just not bother to read it? Yeah. Prime Minister! Uh, I think what, uh, what the Right Honourable Gentleman needs to rip up, Mr Speaker, is his pre-scripted yeah. questions. Yeah. Uh, because because I've, just, I've, just answered, I've just answered the question, and the, the, point, the, point at issue, the point at issue, Mr Speaker, is whether or Louise not the Hague, government the Shadow was Charles properly notified. Furiously 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 and it's not about what happened the previous evening. I knew about it on the Thursday it became public. But the, the company concerned has a duty uh, to notify the government 45 days, uh, Mr Speaker, before they take action of that kind. That is why we're taking the action that we are to protect hard-working people. And what we're also doing, by the way, Mr Speaker, this month is lifting the living wage for all workers across our country. Uh, by another thousand pounds, so it's up five thousand pounds since 2015. I think that's what we call an irrelevant point. Uh, <laughs> he speci- he specialises. Yeah, yeah. Um, we should point out, Owen Patterson, who Keir Starmer was referring to, he was the uh, former Environment Secretary. Who uh, there was a scandal when it emerged. He'd been uh, doing a bit of work on the side as an MP alongside his full time job as a food lobbyist. That's a lobbyist for Randolph's uh, Corporation. Which was paying him much more money than he earned as an MP. Um, and at that point, it was found he'd broken the rules. Boris Johnson uh, whipped his MPs to try and save his skin, change the rules, let him off. Then it all fell apart again, and actually he ended up resigning. Um, so. Keir Starmer is sort of trying to, to square that with, well, you tried to save one man's job because he was your mate. And 800 people have 800 been laid people off. have been laid off through uh, no fault of their own. Yeah, it, well, it comes back to that that phrase we don't hear as much from Keir Starmer nowadays, but the old uh, the old Labour hardy perennial, one rule for them, one rule for the rest. That's the, yeah. the point he's trying to land there. Um, and, uh, and then Boris Johnson going off and talking about the, the lifting the living wage, which is, which is, which is fine, if, if not necessarily on topic. Uh, let's go back now to this is question number three from Keir Starmer. Starmer. I think the Prime Minister just said he knew about it on the day. Yeah. I take it from that answer the Prime Minister didn't read his WhatsApp briefing. <laughs> Surely not. Let's test his rhetoric. <laughs> Mr Speaker, That's a reference since to the, the story in the papers today about ministers getting information on WhatsApp. You know, have received over £38 million of government contracts. And the parent company, DP World, is lined up for £50 million of taxpayers' money under the Freeport scheme. The government is apparently reviewing these contracts. But reviews don't save save jobs. Can the Prime Minister guarantee, guarantee that these companies will not get a penny more of taxpayers' money or a single tax break until they reinstate the workforce? Mr Speaker, I think what the House has already heard is that we are taking legal action against the, against the, yes we are, against the company concerned under, under the 1992 uh, Employment uh, and Trades Union and Labour Relation uh, Act and that is the, the right thing to do because it seems to me, Mr Speaker, that they have broken the law. But if he is asking, if he's asking this government to do what Labour usually want us to do and actively pitchfork away investment around the country from overseas, Mr Speaker, then that is not what we will do. We'll take them to court, we'll, we'll defend the rights of British workers. What we will not do, Mr Speaker, is launch a wholehearted campaign, as they would want, against overseas investment, because that is, that is completely wrong and wrong for those workers, Mr Speaker. So it's interesting, Boris, I'm now very confused about the, bit, the, the legislation he's referring to, because it was 94, I thought, before, and now we're in, there is a Trade Union and Labour Relations Consolidation Act, 1992. There's a, then there's also a Trade Union Reform and Employment Rights Act, 1993, uh, order of 1994. I mean, you know, it's good for you to update your but, wall charts at but, home. But what's interesting is Boris Johnson is presumably talking about legislation I'm, I'm, that was introduced in the wake of... European you know, Jacques Delors, who he made so much hay criticising as a as a te- uh, Brussels correspondent for the Telegraph, introduced in the wake of uh, his social chapter in the in the Maastricht Treaty, and at the same time he's saying, well, look, it's brilliant that we have left the European Union. We're so open to foreign investment, and also Brexit gives British workers, uh, you know, much more protection than they would have otherwise. It's a bit of a bit of a mess of contradictions that one, I think. 
Yes, I think you could well be right, and it's not. It's not. It's even a bit unclear as to exactly how the government is taking legal action against P and O. It's I almost as if they're they're not. In one of his answers, he appeared to be suggesting he was encouraging the workers to do that, which is a slightly separate point. Uh, right, we can go back to the House of Commons and the PMQs unpacked live on Times Radio. Well, DP World must be quaking in their boots. <laughs> the Prime Minister says how disappointed he is in them, whilst handing them fifty million pounds. Spe- uh, Prime Minister said about the law, speaking of hollow reviews, as the law stands, it's not illegal to pay seafarers below the national minimum wage, right. even, if they're, even if they're working out of UK ports and in UK waters. Two years ago, Prime Minister, his government admitted that that was unjustifiable, two years ago, and promised two years ago, yes. you've guessed it, to review it. Two years on, despite what he says today, nothing's been done, leaving the gate wide open for P&O. British workers don't need another empty review, they need action. So when will the Prime Minister fix that gap in the law? Uh, Mr Speaker, with with great humility, I I must ask the Right Honourable Gentleman to listen to the answer that I gave uh, to the first question. Because it, it would then help him uh, to scrap his third or fourth question and try another one. Uh, we, are, we are going to address the, uh, the defects in the 1998 Living Wage Act, uh, Minimum Wage Act, and make sure that everybody, everybody serving, everybody serving in the UK exclusive economic zone, working in the UK exclusive economic zone, gets paid the living wage as people do in the rest of the country. Here's Star- He's, Another he's a, piece of legislation for exactly. you to update. He's been reading Hansard under the bedsheets, hasn't he? He's at last conceded the point, though. Yeah. Um, which is that... Yeah, there was actually no difference at all between what Keir Starmer said and what Boris Johnson then conceded, that they'd previously said that essentially if you are working out of a British port in British waters, you can be paid anything they like. Yeah. Uh, and actually that would make you end up working incredibly long days to, to, to earn a decent living. Um, and he's going to say they've got to address the deficiencies in the 1998 Minimum Wage Act, passed by Tony Blair. Uh, and, you know, we've had several prime ministers since then who've clearly done nothing about it. But he's conceded the point that um, they said they were going to do something about it two years ago, and they haven't, and now they might. Yes, exactly, and that they need to do something. Um, and that actually it turns out that British workers aren't insulated from unscrupulous, or workers, you know, as you say, working in the... Uh, the exclusive economic zone of the United Kingdom, as the Prime Minister put it there, um, you know, uh, British ports in in, uh, in in normal speak, uh, aren't protected. So we've taken, you know, about 10 minutes to realise that uh, actually he's conceded the point to Keir Starmer. Yeah, as Matt on uh, YouTube says, two years is a long time to know there's a problem and do nothing about it. Gary said that the Trade Union and Labour Consolidation Act 1992 was then amended in February 2018. Thank you for that. And uh, Simon says, Patrick looks very smart with his tie on. Uh, If you want to see Patrick with his tie on, uh, go online to YouTube, search for Times Radio. You can watch Long Live and tell us what you think of PMQ so far. It's from Zara. (laughs) <laughs> oh, coming to a bit of money <laughs> <laughs> and spending it while I still can. Uh, let's go. Let's go back uh, to House Commons. This is question five from Keir Starmer. Uh, the problem is that's what he said two years ago. Yeah. It didn't happen. A PO took advantage of the gap left wide open by this Prime Minister. Yes. P&O's behaviour comes off the back of a string of fire and re-fire, rehire cases. Yeah. Profitable companies threatening to fire workers unless they accept a pay cut. The Prime Minister keeps telling us just how opposed he is to fire and rehire. But as we saw on Monday, as we saw, Mr Speaker, as we saw on Monday, he doesn't have the backbone to ban it. Whilst he sits on his hands, more and more workers are having their lives thrown upside down by this appalling practice. What good to them is a Prime Minister who's all mouth and no trousers? Yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, the, the, the most notable practitioners of, of fire and rehire are, of course, the Labour Party uh, themselves. Uh, but but I, I can, uh, he, he, may be interested, he may be interested to know we will be vindicating the rights of, of British workers, uh, UK employees, under uh, UK law. But the, the law that the P&O, co- the company themselves, are allegedly relying on uh, was introduced, I can tell him, as a result of EU directives. And, uh, and uh, never, uh, never forget, 
Never forget, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and he may not like it. That's the reality. He would have kept us. He would have kept us unable to change it, unable to get out of it. Uh, he would have made it impossible for us to protect UK employees in the way that we're going to do. But what we're doing, Mr. Speaker, above all, is ensuring uh, that workers in this country have the best protection of all, which is a job, Mr. Speaker. And, under this government, thanks to the steps that we have taken, thanks to the stewardship of the economy by my right honourable friend, which you'll be hearing about in a little bit more, Mr Speaker, we have people in payroll employment, 600,000 more of them than before the pandemic began. When Boris Johnson said that the Labour Party was a practitioner of hiring fire, I thought we might have got an Angela Rayner joke about uh, fire and rehire, given the number of times that Keir Starmer's tried to fire and she's ended up with another job title. Uh, I wasn't really sure what he was... He's talking about... So Labour, uh, as we know, are in straightened financial oh, so circumstances, the Labour Party. Uh, facing uh, lawsuits from just about everybody who worked for them under Jeremy <laughs> Corbyn. Union donations are drying up. Um, and so they've laid off a lot of staff and they've been accused of trying to rehire for uh, similar slash identical roles on insecure contracts of the kind they would criticise as a party founded and funded to a large extent by the trade unions that they would criticise other employers for um, for uh, for using. Um, but that's separate from the, the separate issue of the literal fire and rehire legislation uh, proposed by the Labour MP, Gar Barry, Barry Gardner. Barry Gardner was in this very studio early this week making the point that if they'd t taken up his suggestion in October rather than uh, getting Tory MPs to talk it out his backbench bill, then this might might not have happened. Exactly. So they opposed that, and then they all the Tories were also whipped to abstain on an opposition day motion uh, that Labour put forward on this same subject on Monday. Um, so, you know, I think Keir Starmer's got a point to say. It's a bit, you know, a bit rum for Boris Johnson to stand at the dispatch box saying, oh, we're going to, uh, we're the party of Labour market protections and we're also going to tighten uh, this uh, lacuna in uh, minimum wage legislation when they've been given repeated opportunities to vote on this very uh, on this very safeguard and they've passed them up. And actually, uh, John on uh, the YouTube channel says, I'm honestly not sure what the strategic benefit there is to Labour being the party arguing against the free market. But actually, Boris Johnson's doing the same thing. They're both trying to see who can be the most interventionist and yeah, exactly. the most regulatory. Um, and yet, you're right. And in, 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 in a few weeks' time, Boris Johnson will make a speech where he'll talk about tearing up red tape and freeing businesses to let a thousand flowers bloom, whatever it is. Yeah, exactly. Boris Johnson's new voters, it, the voters over which these two parties are competing, aren't frothing, uh, you know, IEA subscribing uh, members of, you know, the Margaret Thatcher fan club. They are right on questions of culture broadly, this is simplistic, and left on the economy. That's how a shadow cabinet minister put it to me yesterday. Um, and you don't you don't win over those voters by being the Tory party of mass redundancies that yeah. they remember so clearly and vividly from the 1980s and 90s. And because this, 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 this mass redundancy, there's a massive question of fairness. Mm -hmm. You know, people know that sometimes companies get into trouble and they have to lay off staff. But they, that isn't the, that isn't what what's happening. There's a multi-million pound international company which just thinks it can do it on the cheap, uh, which is why it's treated people so badly. Right, let's go back then to uh, as the final question for PMQs. I'm Pat Kistama. He can complain all he likes, but on Monday he ordered all of his lot to abstain on a vote to ban fire and rehire. Exactly. There was a Labour opposition day motion on Monday, all did. which would have been non-binding if the then, government abstained. Mr. Speaker. To add insult to injury, after the vote, his party posted a message saying that, where possible, they will look to find p and workers new jobs. Pathetic. 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 They don't want new jobs. They want their old jobs back. They don't want a Prime Minister hoisting the white flag. They want him to fight for their livelihoods. 82,000 seafarers in this country I've spoken to dockers, engineers, deckhands and sailors. They're all worried about what this means for them. Yeah. This morning, one of them said to me, if P&O can get away with this, other companies will get rid of us too and replace us with cheap labour from abroad. Why does the Prime Minister think that they will take a crumb of comfort from his half assed bluster and waffle today? Yeah. I apologise for that Mr. foul language. p and plainly aren't going to get away with it any more than any more than any more... Uh, any more than any other company that, that treats its employees in that scandalous, 
way, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, this, is a, this is a historic moment for this country, actually, uh, because it's now two years since, uh, two years to the day uh, that we went into lockdown. And uh, that plunged this country Quite into the, the biggest, uh, deepest loss of output that we've seen uh, in our lifetimes. And uh, thanks to the Chancellor, who protected the economy, who protected jobs, who protected companies, uh, we've now been able to come out faster and more effectively than any other comparable economy. We have unemployment back down to 3.9%. We have 600,000 more people on the payroll, Mr Speaker. And the best assurance we can give workers around the country is that the economy is now bigger than it was before the pandemic began. And we will continue to get the big calls right uh, as we got the big calls right uh, during the pandemic. They got the big calls wrong. They would do absolutely nothing to protect workers, let alone P&O workers, uh, Mr Speaker, because, because not only would they have kept us in lockdown and kept those ships in port, Mr Speaker, unable to move, that's the reality, kept those ships in port, but Mr Speaker, there has never been a Labour government that left left office with unemployment lower than when they began. That is the reality, and that's their record on jobs. There we are. Wow. I was going to say there was a touch of Gordon Brown in Keir Starmer criticising p for hiring workers overseas and the Tories being the party of uh, cheap overseas labour, but then he said half arsed and Gordon Brown, a self-respecting, pious son of the manse, would never utter such foul language at the dispatch box, would he? I've looked it up. It's not the first time somebody's used half arsed in the House of Commons. Mm. Uh, it was uh, Nicholas Soames on the 11th of December of the year 2000. It, it, what, what was he talking about? Uh, this, <laughs> this, was, uh, this appears to be some sort of military debate. Uh, and uh, he was talking about NATO. Uh, um, yeah. And he talked about a, Timely. Half, a foolish half arsed idea. So there we are. Um, so uh, standards are slipping. Now, I would say, in terms, of, I mean, clearly the biggest political event of the day is the spring statement. We'll talk to our chief political commentator Lucy Fisher in a moment. But as a as a political exercise, that was one of the sharpest from Keir Starmer we've seen. Yeah, absolutely. I completely completely agree. Is there a new person writing the questions? They were all, but I mean, they weren't even questions. One of them was. Um, uh, why are you so all mouth and no trousers or something? That it's not a quite like good punchy political point scoring, rather than the sort of barrister interrogation that we've seen in the past. It has a lot to do with Keir Starmer's confidence. When you speak to people who work with Keir Starmer on a daily basis, they say um, he is a confidence player, and you could tell this time uh, last year uh, and last summer he clearly wasn't confident. He was in, slightly embattled internally. Now he he he's on he's on confident ground. Yeah, had in the polls, but also on this. He knows he Boris knows Johnson is bang to rights yeah, on this. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. And clearly Boris Johnson knew he was bang to rights because he's done a lot of research on it. He's read up on all these bills and legislation and things that he hasn't changed yet, but he's got to get round to uh, very soon. Right, that brings us to the end of PMQ's unpacked. You can stay watching us on uh, on the YouTube channel though, because I will bring you Rishi Sunak's uh, statement live from the House of Commons just as soon as he's at the dispatch box. We can go live to Westminster now. Lucy Fisher, our chief political commentator, is there. Go on then, Lucy. Um, I'm sure you've been leaked the entire spring statement. What can we expect? (laughs) I wish. Well, I think some of the measures we're expecting have been quite widely trailed. Uh, There's a a very high expectation that fuel duty will be cut, potentially that national insurance contribution thresholds will rise, which could take as many as 150,000 of the lowest paid uh, members of society out of uh, contributing to it altogether could be a bigger rabbit than that. We know that Rishi Sunak usually succeeds in holding something back that isn't trailed, but uh, certainly all the mood music from the Treasury has been that this isn't a major moment for policy inventions. We don't know how big the scale of the uh, energy uh, price crisis will be. He's said that there'll be more uh, to consider in the autumn. So I think we'll have to wait and see. Uh, We've just heard that uh, Rishi Sunak addressed uh, Cabinet earlier on 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 his uh, plans. Uh, number 10 saying he told the cabinet the economic outlook was challenging. I mean, that's a, a certain amount of understatement there. We've had in, inflation hitting 6.2% today, the highest for 30 years. Uh, petrol prices climbing ever higher. Uh, f- uh, gas and electricity bills already at hu- massive highs and going to go even higher this year. Um, uh, uh, and there's an expectation, isn't there now, Lucy, on Rishi Sinat, particularly because of what he did during the pandemic, that when when the economic outlook is challenging, Rishi Sunak comes to your rescue. 
Well, that's right. And it's actually a reputation that he himself has tried to gild in the broadcast rounds he's been doing ahead of the spring statement today. He said, look at my actions to date. Um, you know, I'm a show not tell kind of chancellor. He's trying to ride two horses, really. He says he wants to be a tax cutting um, chancellor, but also wants to, uh, you know, uh, have a reputation for fiscal responsibility, which means that that's very difficult to do. There will be some measures today. He's made that crystal clear. But whether it goes um, far enough, fast enough, given the very dire economic headwinds facing the country and the, the burden on household finances, as you pointed out, remains to be seen. And just from the Labour Party's point of view, Lucy, quite a big moment for Rachel Reeves this. She's not had this because uh, obviously the budget, it's always the leader of the opposition who responds. What what do you think will be the message that Rachel Steve, Rachel Rachel Stevens Rachel Reeves is planning to try and land at the dispatch box today? Well, you're right. It is a very big moment for her. Interestingly, it seems that uh, Rishi Sunak is trying to shoot Labour's fox in terms of the rhetoric around the economy, using this word security, trying to make sure that the nation's economy is secure, but also that households feel secure in managing their own budgets. Um, she will she will speak to Labour policies and their um, proposals. They want to see a major windfall tax on oil and gas. I think she'll speak to some of the, the figures that that could raise. It's very unlikely that that's a policy that Rishi Sunak will want to steal. Um, and uh, in fact, I'll tell you what, Lucy, I'll let you go into the, the Commons so that you can go and sit in the gallery and see it all happen. Uh, we'll speak to you later on. That's Lucy Fisher, our chief political commentator, live from Westminster there, gearing up for the uh, Chancellor's spring statement, which is due any minute now in the uh, in the House of Commons. Uh, just to update you on some of the other news that we've been keeping across today, the London Ambulance says it's dealing with what it describes as a major incident at the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park in East London at the Aquatic Centre. It's understood to involve the release of a gas. A number of people are reportedly being treated for breathing difficulties and fire and ambulance crews are on site. The London Mayor, Sadiq Khan, has told people to stay away from the area. In Ukraine, the Ukrainian, Prime Minister, uh, the Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky, has said that about 100,000 people remain trapped in the besieged port city of Mariupol. He said of no food, water or medical supplies as Russian shelling continues. Meanwhile, the US and other Western nations are understood to be considering a move to potentially exclude Russia from the G20 group of largest economies. But China has said it supports Putin's participation in the next G20 summit, describing Russia as an important member. Patrick Maguire, Times Redbox editor, is still with me. We're keeping an eye on the House of Commons as soon as Rishi Sunak gets on his feet. Uh, we'll go live there. Marietta Fostop will be uh, here as soon as he's finished, uh, laying out his spring statement with the best uh, analysis and reaction you, you need all the way through till four o'clock. And Times Radio Drive coming live from College Green in Westminster with John Pina. Um, Patrick Maguire, what, do you, what does success look like today for Rishi Sunak? Or is he, at best, trying to avoid failure? Success looks like Conservative MPs, politically, on a purely political basis, success for Rishi Sunak looks like Conservative MPs conceding that he has done as much as he possibly can. The risk for Rishi Sunak is Tory MPs have been around the studios this morning, they've written for the Times Red Box and other places with a long shopping list. You know, they and it's not just the principle, right? He could get up and say, I'm going to increase the th threshold at which people pay national insurance. I'm going to increase universal credit allowances. I'm going to cut fuel duty. And perhaps I'm going to cut green levies on your energy bills too. The risk is that he could announce all of that and Tory MPs think he hasn't gone quite far enough. You know, that, that, that it'll be criticism degree, not of principle. And the trouble is, Tory MPs are not, you know, there's a lot of tribes in there. You've got the ones, you should traditional right-wing, uh, economically conservative MPs who want lower taxes, smaller state. And then you've got lots of other MPs who, who say they want lower taxes, smaller state, but they just want the state to spend huge amounts of money on the particular things that they're concerned about. Yeah, and there's a risk he alienates both groups. Because he only does a, he does a little bit which isn't enough for the groups who want more, and it's a bit too much for those who didn't want it. Yeah, exactly. And, and the, big, the biggest elephant in the room is the fact that, you know, regardless of how much tinkering he does with other taxes, um, he is slapping a 1.25 percentage increase on national insurance. Um, and that is still inimical to lots of Tory MPs. People like Mark Harper have been on the airwaves this morning, the former chief whip, saying, well, look, the principle of government spending having to be paid for by something that isn't borrowing is important. But I think lots of Tory MPs would say, yes, but 
uh, increasing taxes during a recession is sort of economics 101 uh, to many of them as the number one thing you don't do if you care about uh, tax receipts and the health of the public finances more broadly. So it was interesting. Uh, Kieran Pedley from uh, Ipsos Moy put out some polling this morning. Uh, Rishi Sunak's uh, reputation is still still holding up 44 percent of the public. So they're satisfied with uh, the job Rishi is doing as chancellor. This compared to an average of 42%, going all the way back to 1976. Um, which, as Kieran pointed out, that's quite something when 76% of people say they expect the economy to worsen in the coming year. I mean, it's down from the, what, 64% of people were satisfied with him early on. Now, but this is another interesting thing. Some polling, I think, that Ipsos Mori did for uh, the London Evening Standard. The Conservatives are more trusted on growing the economy. Uh, whereas uh, the Labour Party is more trusted on um, helping people with their cost of living. And that essentially, as Kieran says, that's battle lines drawn for the ne- for the next election. The stewardship of the economy uh, versus th- th- how people are feeling that in their pockets. Exactly. And a shadow cabinet minister put this to me yesterday. Labour has to appear, has to be ambitious while not appearing radical to the electorate. And that is much, much trickier than you might expect. And that's a key divide. Where those two... Uh, you know, metrics of credibility collide in set, um, you know, helping people with the cost of living. That's sort of in line with people thinking Labour are broadly nice, hearts in the right place, trust them to run the NHS or whatever. But the point at which Labour's measures don't appear credible, and you better believe the Tories will hammer them on this between now and then, um, you know, uh, talking about, you know, as Boris Johnson closed PMQs, bankrupting the country, leaving people out of work. Um, It's quite familiar terrain for the Tories, even if the broad economic outlook isn't isn't great. And uh, well, so this is Matt Jolly on Times Radio. We are waiting for Rishi Sunak to step up at the uh, dispatch box to deliver his spring statement. He's got an awful lot to try and juggle, an awful lot of groups to try and please. He's got a bit of wiggle room. Is it £30 billion possibly as a result of better than expected yeah. tax receipts? It's, it's the interesting thing about the inflation. In one respect, it's terrible because it's, uh, it's terrible for Rishi Sunak from so many angles, right? It hammers uh, people on cost of living, but also makes it much more difficult for him to resist calls for intervention because he's got so much fiscal headroom. I expect he'll be at the dispatch box saying, look, we have to have a war chest for shocks. But Tory MPs will be pointing to that £30 billion saying, can't you spend a little bit of that, please? And if he does spend it, even then it's probably not going to be enough. Taking even 5p off the price of petrol, I mean, it's something, but when it's going up by that much every week mm. uh, it, whether or not people notice it fe- appreciate it and he gets any political benefit from it it'll be an interesting uh, thing to keep an eye on uh, you're listening to Times Red is Matt Jolly uh, with you we await Rishi Sunak setting out his spring statement we'll bring you uh, the key exchanges from the spring statement Mariella Foster will be here immediately after with us with all the reaction and analysis you need then John Pienaar coming to you live from College Green in Westminster this afternoon from 4 o'clock today uh, and then uh, analysis for the rest of the evening as well with Phil Williams from 7 o'clock. And Carol Walk will be here from 10, uh, taking a look at tomorrow's papers as they come in. Because, Patrick, that would be, that's going to be a big... There's always a big test with these things. Does the Daily Mail... Have get a the, cartoon, have on, a cartoon the on the front page? Do they Photoshop him onto something? And these feel like quite serious times. There's an awful lot uh, that Rishi Sunak's been dem- uh, uh, having demanded of him. Yes, exactly. But this is an interesting one, isn't it, this cost of living crisis i mean you know interesting in the confucius sense that we live in interesting times perhaps but if this goes badly if rishi sunak mismanages this call we might not know for a long time and i was struck by you know thinking about rishi sunak's age he's barely 40 inflation is at its, is at its highest for 30 years this raises a much more fundamental question about the economy for people of rishi sunak's age they've broadly known with the exception of the financial crash an economy that's been growing they haven't really known since Black Wednesday meaningful, meaningfully high interest rates. They've come into the economy at the time of decent growth, okay, stagnant wage growth, but you know, not being eaten into by inflation. They've only known their standard of living increasing, including you know lots of Tory voters, lots of new Tory voters as well. So this starts to bite over the next few years. A whole generation of people for the first time will be thinking, "Hang on, you know, I'm feeling the government squeezing yeah. my income, or you know, be that by a conscious policy decision like the national insurance rise." or through Sunak's negligence. And it, it will be fascinating to see the impact of this. It, it, this might be one of these things we've forgotten about by the same by this time next week, or it could become a, a major pivot point in what decides politics for the next year or two and then ultimately an election. Yeah, particularly if inflation continues to soar, 
Um, those two questions. Which all 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 expectations are because of energy bills and gas bills and uh, um, uh, petrol and diesel. Yeah, exactly. And th- that national insurance rise, it's such a becomes such a fundamental fork in the road moment for Rishi Sunak, hasn't it? Lots of pressure from within cabinet, from within his backbenches, but it has become sort of the the foundation stone of this path Rishi Sunak has chosen. And um, it could prove a decisive turning point in both his reputation and how the Tories are perceived to have handled this cost of living crisis more broadly. And there he is, Rishi Sunak, sitting on the front bench in the House of Commons, slightly biting his lip and looking a, a little bit pensive. It looks greyer than he does he two do, years ago, he doesn't does he? Look, he does look like he's been through uh, rather a lot. Uh, he told his cabinet colleagues this morning the financial outlook is challenging because of soaring inflation and the in Russian invasion of Ukraine. He, brought, uh, he, uh, he said the, the global shocks that they'd had. He said that throughout the pandemic, the government has shown the British people we are on their side and will continue to stand by them through the uncertainty that we now face. Uh, Rishi Sunak then described how the sensible management of the public finances enabled the government to step in and help people with £9 billion of support for their energy bills in February. He said this government would continue to take a responsible and sustainable approach in order to be able to grow a stronger, more secure economy for the future. That word, secure, security, keep your eye out for that. Well, that's the key thing. It was only a couple of weeks ago he spent £9 billion on energy bills, and that's gone. In people's minds, in people's bills, that's already evaporated. That's, that's completely gone. The two numbers we'll hear a lot from Labour today are 600 and 200. 600 being the amount Labour's windfall tax they say would raise for the 9 million poorest households, and 200 being the amount everybody else would get. Um, and given that everybody has forgotten the 200 quid rebate, loan, uh, charitable donation that Rishi Sunak, as you say, barely a month ago, uh, offered to the public, um, I, I suspect we're going to be hearing a lot more from Labour uh, about the conscious decision, again, to hike taxes 15 times. Uh, that's another number we'll be hearing a lot about Rishi Sunak's 15 tax rises. Um, not to levy a tax on you know, the gas companies making lots of money, and uh, their decision to clobber workers with a national insurance rise. Yeah, well, um, we are still waiting for PMQs to, to end. A lot, we... lot of MPs with P&O staff being called by the Speaker. I know that's Natalie Elphick, uh, the MP for Dover, being called now. Carl Turner, the Labour MP for uh, Hull East, another big ferry port, was called before. So Lindsay Hoyle has clearly had representations from them saying, let me, let me get on BBC... Uh, BBC, look look east today, please. Yeah, and Boris Johnson having confirmed at PMQs that the government will take legal action against PNO through a, a variety of uh, pieces of legislation that he was uh, he was uh, clearly read up on. Um, we are now. I think we are now awaiting. Yes, we, uh, Lindsay Hoyle is uh, just addressing the House of Commons. He's got a Ukraine blue and yellow ribbon on and a blue and yellow tie. So, uh, right, I think we're finally there now. Uh, Patrick McGuire, Times Red Box editor, thank you for joining us. Uh, You are listening to Times Radio. We are about to bring you Rishi Sunak's spring statement uh, live from the House of Commons, where he sets out, as he described it, the financial outlook is challenging. He's got a lot of challenges. Can he rise to it? Uh, We will bring you all of the analysis and reaction you need immediately afterwards. Mariella Foster will be picking up the baton uh, just after one o'clock today, all the way through then till four o'clock with all the analysis you need. And then from four o'clock, live from the how- from College Green, just outside the House of Parliament, John pino has got his big coat on and his big marquee, uh, and he'll be down on College Green speaking to uh, economists and MPs and getting all the reaction you need to the uh, spring statement. Not a budget, of course. The budget's now been moved to the autumn. We can now go live to the House of Commons. The Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, as I stand here, men, women, and children are huddled in basements across Ukraine seeking protection. Soldiers and citizens alike have taken up arms to defend their land and families. The sorrow we feel for their suffering and admiration for their bravery is only matched by the gratitude we feel for the security in which we live. And what underpins that security is the strength of our economy. It gives us the ability to fund the armed forces we need to maintain our liberty, the resources we need to support our allies, the power to impose sanctions which cause severe economic costs, and 
the flexibility to support businesses and individuals through crises as they emerge. But, Mr Speaker, we should be in no doubt. Behind Putin's invasion is a dangerous calculation that democracies are divided, politically weak and economically insecure, incapable of making tough long-term decisions to strengthen our economies. Mr Speaker, this calculation is mistaken. What the authoritarian mind perceives as division, we know are the passionate disagreements at the heart of our living, breathing democracy. What they see as chaos, we know is the freedom to be dynamic and innovative, and what they call the inherent weakness of open societies and free economies, we know is the source of our strength. We will confront this challenge to our values, not just in the arms and resources we send to Ukraine, but in strengthening our economy here at home. So when I talk about security, yes, I mean responding to the war in Ukraine, but I also mean the security of a faster growing economy, the security of more resilient public finances, and security for working families as we help with the cost of living. Mr Speaker, today's statement builds a stronger, more secure economy for the United Kingdom. We have a moral responsibility to use our economic strength to support Ukraine and working with international partners to impose severe costs on Putin's regime. We are supplying military aid to help Ukraine defend its borders, providing around £400 million in economic and humanitarian aid, as well as up to half a billion dollars in multilateral financial guarantees, and launching the new Homes for Ukraine scheme to make sure those forced to flee have a route to safety here in the UK. And we are imposing sanctions of unprecedented scale and scope. We have sanctioned over a 1,000 individuals, entities and subsidiaries, frozen the assets of major Russian banks, imposed punitive tariffs on tea products, restricted Russia's access to sterling clearing, to insurance, to the UK's capital markets, to SWIFT, and we have targeted the Russian central bank too. Be in no doubt, these sanctions coordinated with our allies are working. The Russian ruble plummeted to record lows. The Moscow Stock Exchange has been largely suspended for a month, and the Central Bank of Russia has been forced to more than double interest rates to 20 per cent. We warned that an aggressive, unprovoked invasion would be met with severe economic costs, and it has. I am proud to say, as the whole House will say, we stand with Ukraine. But, Mr Speaker, the actions we have taken to sanction Putin's regime are not cost-free for us at home. The invasion of Ukraine presents a risk to our recovery, as it does to countries around the world. We came into this crisis with our economy growing faster than expected, with the UK having the highest growth rate in the G7 last year. But the OBR has said specifically there is unusually high uncertainty around the outlook. It is too early to know the full impact of the Ukraine war on the UK economy. But their initial view, combined with high global inflation and continuing supply chain pressures, means the OBR now forecasts growth this year of 3.8%. The OBR then expects the economy to grow by 1.8% in 2023, and 2.1, 1.8, and 1.7 per cent in the following three years. The House will take comfort that the lower growth outlook has not affected our strong jobs performance. Unemployment is now forecast to be lower in every year of the forecast. It is already at 3.9 per cent back to the low levels we saw before the pandemic. But, Mr. Speaker, The war's most significant impact domestically is on the cost of living. Covid and global factors meant goods and energy prices were already high. Statistics published this morning 
show that inflation in February was 6.2 per cent, lower than the US and broadly in line with the euro area. Disruptions to global supply chains and energy markets, combined with the economic response to Putin's aggression, mean the OBR expect inflation to rise further, averaging 7.4 per cent this year. As I said last month, the Government will support the British people as they deal with the rising costs of energy. People should know that we will stand by them as we have throughout the last two years. That is why we have announced a £9 billion plan to help around 28 million households pay around half the April increase in the energy price cap. And people should be reassured that the energy price cap will protect their energy bills between now and the autumn. But I want to help people now, so I am announcing three immediate measures. First, I am going to help motorists. Today, I can announce, for only the second time in 20 years, fuel duty will be cut. Not by one, not even by two, but by five pence per litre. The biggest cut to all fuel duty rates ever. And while some have called for the cut to last until August, I have decided it will be in place until March next year, a full 12 months. Together with the freeze, it is a tax cut this year for hard-working families and businesses worth over £5 billion. And it will take effect from 6 p.m. tonight. Second, as energy costs rise, we know that energy efficiency will make a big difference to bills. But if homeowners want to install energy saving materials, at the moment only some items qualify for a 5% VAT relief, and there are complex rules about who is eligible. The relief used to be more generous, but from 2019 the European Court of Justice required us to restrict its eligibility. But thanks to Brexit, we are no longer constrained by EU law. So I can announce for the next five years, homeowners having materials like solar panels, heat pumps or insulation installed will no longer pay 5% VAT. They will pay zero. We will also reverse the EU's decision to take wind and water turbines out of scope and zero rate them as well. And we will abolish all the red tape imposed on us by the EU. A family having a solar panel set installed will see tax savings worth £1,000 and savings on their energy bill of over £300 per year. And, Mr Speaker, this policy highlights the deficiencies in the Northern Ireland Protocol because we won't immediately be able to apply it to Northern Ireland but we will be raising it with the Commission as a matter of urgency. And I want to reassure members from Northern Ireland that the Executive will receive a Barnet share of the value of the relief until it can be introduced UK-wide. And the Prime Minister will bring forward further measures to reinforce our long-term energy security in the coming weeks. And finally, I want to do more to help our most vulnerable households with rising costs. They need targeted support. So I am doubling the Household Support Fund to a billion pounds with five hundred million pounds of new funding. Local authorities, Mr Speaker, are best placed to help those in need in their local areas, and they will receive this funding from April. Mr Speaker, we can only afford to provide this extra support because of our stronger economy and the tough but responsible decisions we have taken to rebuild our fiscal resilience. Today's forecasts confirm, even after the measures I am announcing today, we are meeting all our fiscal rules. Underlying debt is expected to fall steadily from 83.5% of GDP in 2022-23 to 79.8% in 2026-27. Borrowing as a percentage of GDP is 5.4% this year, 
3.9 per cent next year, then 1.9, 1.3, 1.2 and 1.1 per cent in the following years. At a time when the OBR have said that our fiscal headroom could be wiped out by relatively small changes to the economic outlook, it is right that the central fiscal judgment I am making today is to meet our fiscal rules with a margin of safety. The OBR have not accounted for the full impacts of the war in Ukraine, and we should be prepared for the economy and public finances to worsen potentially significantly. And the cost of borrowing is continuing to rise. In the next financial year, we are forecast to spend £83 billion on debt interest, the highest on record, and almost four times the amount we spent last year. That is why, Mr Speaker, we have already taken difficult decisions with the public finances, and that is why we will continue to weigh carefully calls for additional public spending. More borrowing is not cost or risk free. I said it last autumn and I say it again today. Borrowing down, debt down. Only the Conservatives can be trusted with taxpayers' money. So, Mr. Speaker, our response to the immediate crisis in Ukraine has been unwavering, but we must be equally bold in response to the deeper and more fundamental challenge Putin poses to our values. We must show the world that freedom and democracy remain the best route to peace, prosperity and happiness. We will do so by strengthening our economy here at home. To that end, we are helping families with the cost of living, creating the conditions for accelerated growth and productivity and making sure the proceeds of growth are shared fairly. That is not the work of any one statement, but it does begin today and with one of our most important levers, the tax system. I told the House last autumn my overarching ambition was to reduce taxes by the end of this Parliament. And we will do so in a way that is responsible and sustainable. Today, I am publishing a tax plan. We will take a principled approach to cutting taxes, maintaining space against our fiscal rules, as I have done today, continuing to be disciplined with the first call on any extra resources being lower taxes, not higher spending, and, of course, carefully considering the broader macroeconomic outlook. With those principles in mind, our new tax plan will build a stronger economy by reducing and reforming taxes over this Parliament in three ways. First, we will help families with the cost of living. Second, we will create the conditions for higher growth. And third, we will share the proceeds of growth fairly, ensuring people are left with more of their own money. Let me take each in turn. Mr Speaker, there is now a dedicated funding source for the country's top priority, the NHS and social care, providing funding over the long term as demand grows, with every penny going straight to health and care. If it goes, then so does the funding, and that funding is needed now, especially as my right hon. Friend, the Health Secretary's plans to reform health care will ensure every pound of taxpayers' money is well spent. When I, said, when, I said the Conservatives, when I said the Conservatives were the party of public services, the party of the NHS, I didn't just mean when it was easy. It is a total commitment. So it is right that the health and care levy stays. But a long-term funding solution for the NHS and social care is not incompatible with reducing taxes on working families. Over the last decade, it has been a Conservative mission to promote tax cuts for working people and simplify the system. That's why, that's why Conservative-led governments 
raised the income tax personal allowance from £6,500 in 2010 to the new level of £12,570. But the equivalent thresholds in national insurance, which define how much people can earn NICS free, are still around £3,000 less. Now, the Prime Minister pledged in the 2019 election we would increase those thresholds. We made a big step towards that goal in my first budget in 2020, increasing the national insurance threshold to £9,500. Today, we take the next step. Our current plan is to increase the next threshold this year by £300. But I'm not going to do that, Mr Speaker. I'm going to increase it by the full £3,000. promise to fully equalise the NICS and income tax thresholds. We're listening to Mariella Brostrup on Times Radio and we're listening to the Chancellor Rishi Sunak's spring statement live from the House of Commons. ...to earn £12,570 a year without paying a 